One of the most well-known hedge fund managers may close up shop. David Tepper has held discussions with LPs about converting to a family office at some point in time. It could be this year. It could be years from now. A timeline to return capital to investors and convert to a family office has not yet been established, his spokesperson said. The exact reason why Tepper is considering throwing in the towel couldn't immediately be learned. But he recently purchased the Carolina Panthers for $2.2 billion and has been devoting time to the ownership of that team. Additionally, his own capital already represents 70 percent of Appaloosa's $13 billion worth of assets under management. Tepper frequently returns a portion of outside capital to manage the size of his AUM and maximize returns. Tepper started the firm 26 years ago and is said to have generated 25 percent annualized returns on average since then. Last year, he was reportedly uh, to be down slightly. Now, if he returns capital, he may liquidate some of his current holdings, the largest as of the first quarter, include Micron, PG&E, and Allergan, according to his uh, 13F filing. Those holdings, of course, may have changed in the seven weeks since then, Scott. So, Weiss, you, you know David better than everybody at the table. I mean, he's long had the view that it's a, it's a tough market, right, to, to navigate it. And yet, he's navigated, navigated it better than almost anybody. Um, I actually think he made money uh, last year, even yeah. in the upset of the end of the year. You know, uh, I remember when I was sitting on the set of Squawk on the Street when he said on that down day around Christmas Eve that he had done some nibbling. And we sort of joke now that, you know, a Tepper's nibble is somebody else's uh, big bite, if not buffet. Um, so he's managed to sort of navigate the, the best of markets and the worst of markets better than most. Without a doubt, and he makes big bets at top and bottom. But uh, look, in between uh, whipping his butt this weekend, the golf course taking a dollar on uh, on Saturday, and last <laughs> week was even more damaging. He probably fell off the Ford, uh, the Forbes billionaire list when I took 18 bucks last week. Uh, <laughs> there's frustration with the markets, clearly, and uh, some of the observations I've made are a function of conversations I've had with people, including Dave, and they find it very, very frustrating, and. Um, you know, I'm, I'm careful what I say because I don't want to talk out of school, but look, it's not the market anybody grew up in. There's no playbook. You don't have the confidence of doing it. No, I think he'd be the first one to say that if he were sitting at the table. Yeah, he said it. And, um, and that's really the issue. He has the ability to go to cash. He has the ability to be net short. He's not typically a big short player in stocks, but he is in futures. But it's like... At some point, it just becomes way, way too difficult without the foreseeable reward. And even if you're positive in the market, you don't see big upside. So why do it? Les, and, you know, while others have sort of grown their AUM to, you know, some astronomical numbers, mm -hmm. uh, no need to mention any, any names, he, he's always sort of thought, I don't need to be the biggest on the block. Right. My total return is more important than my AUM. One number beats the other one. Every day of the week. Right. And you've seen this pressure for asset managers these days to really diversify and get into areas like quant investing and quantum mental using all of these different sophisticated data models. You know, that's expensive and that's really a different business, as Steve was saying, in, you know, than what he grew up in and kind of requires him to expand into an area that he may not be comfortable or may not feel a competence in. But a lot of LPs are really pressuring managers to kind of think creatively, especially as the markets have made just your traditional hedge fund investing so much more difficult. Yeah, I mean, you, the, the thing I'd say is that, because I've gotten the question, okay, he's bought the Panthers, so he's still engaged. The guy is as engaged today in stocks and in markets as he's ever been. Never lost the focus on it, so it's not a function of I've got the Panthers here. He's got people running that. It's enjoyable for him. It's great. I wouldn't call it a hobby, what he paid for it, but yet, you know, he's still fully, fully engaged. Can you have a two, two whatever billion dollar hobby? <laughs> it's a nice hobby to have. I, yeah. I, as I said, after golf, I don't know if he could afford the team today. But uh, yeah. it is um, it is interesting, though, in the last year. And Leslie, you've you've been all over this, as we say, following the money because that's what you do uh, every day. The, the names that have left the business, mm -hmm. um, and this is the biggest, right. you know, uh, to date that I can think of. Maybe I'm missing somebody along the way, but. It's a statement in and of itself about the state of the industry. Right. I mean, I'm hoping I still have a beat 
you know, <laughs> if all these guys keep converting to a family office, you know, what am I going to cover every day? Um, but you're right. Highfields was the most prominent name to close up shop. I think it was roughly the same size as Appaloosa uh, is today. Was that John Jacobson? Yeah. Yes. Um, that was toward the end of last year. A lot of people predicted more names, more big names to close up shop in the first quarter. But then we, of course, kind of saw the rally and a lot of people were able to fight back and, and keep their hedge funds in business. Um, but it is certainly a trend and a family office, especially as you, you know, these hedge funds, all of the different paperwork and kind of red tape and bureaucracy that they have to deal with these days, um, managing pension fund money is a, a big change, especially in the last uh, decade or so, um, that has required the business to be a lot more kind of operational and less, you know, let's just focus on the markets and pick the best stocks and, you know, short the, the worst stocks. You know, it's, it's just become a lot more complicated. A, a lot of funds have closed because they've had massive redemptions because of performance. Mm -hmm. That's not what Dave's ever done. Right. Even in big years. Well, of course, because his performance has been great. Phenomenal. You know, every year. Now he's as sort of, you know, his management style, if you want to call it that, portfolio management style, is to return money, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, to investors uh, every year for years. He's returned at one point two and a half billion. You know, when he got to twenty. Billion well, it goes back to saying that it's not. You know, the si size matters. Yes, it does. Okay. Um, but again, it's the return, the total return, rather than mm -hmm. saying I'm the biggest hedge fund <clears throat> on the street. I don't need, you know, 30 or 40 billion dollars uh, under management. But active managers now, Steve, are and Joe are, are having uh, a better go of it after being in the dumps for a while. They are. To me, that's why Stanley Druckenmiller is one of the best. I think he was one of the first big names to convert. You know, but I think he yeah. converted in 2010. Um, he he kind of saw uh, saw it coming. Um, I, I guess what, what, what I see with the hedge funds, first of all, the hedge funds that I've been invested in, most of the money that I have made in hedge funds, it's been that the strategy has been outside of equities. Right. It's, it's been in distressed assets. It's been in uh, 13 and 14. It was about mortgage-backed securities. It was about the credit markets. That seemed to be where the opportunity was. And I guess the question is, Steve, a lot of the hedge fund community, their last stop is to pivot to a quant shop. And I don't know if David ever made that move, but you see a lot of no, people doing it, and I don't know how successful they really are at doing that. Well, you know, Adam Parker was here, right? He, was, he went to Eminence for quant. Now he's launching his own, his own shop. Look, I, I think they've all gotten into trying to figure out if data can be helpful to them, you know, big data. Um, I, you know, I, I can tell you Dave's thought about it, never made the move. Um, yeah, but people don't have his view on the market, and you sit with him, and, you know, there's complete clarity. Stevie right. Cohn did add a quant arm, a lots of quant dollars. But are they having success did. with it? Are they having the renaissance, Jim Simon, success? Well, I, I, I think, uh, look, I can't answer for all of them. I, I think that a lot haven't when they've gone to a quant strategy. Uh, and quant strategies just, just experienced a flood of capital about right. four years ago. And unless you have that arms race... That, that a renaissance has with 50 or 60 PhDs, and I've looked very closely at that, that continue to refine their model. They refine their model definitively every 12 months, if not sooner. Most don't have that capability. Yeah. So what they brought you as a potential investor in terms of your quant investing is all markets already caught up to it in a year or 12 months, or they can't grow the capital yeah. base excess over a certain level and run into trouble when it doesn't work. What I